to accomplish our God-given destiny, we're going to have to go against the flow of this world system. You are sons and daughters of the Most High God. and that word change means to alter, transform, or revolutionize. Welcome to session three. So excited about what we're going to talk about. The title of this session is Your Internal GPS. Now, let me begin with a question. I'm going to ask this, and I don't want you to be surface with me. What is your ultimate goal in life? In other words, what desire outweighs all other desires? Now, can you be honest? Because if you're honest, you'll not end up in a place you don't want to find yourself. For example, if I take my smartphone and I want to go to the mall and I program my smartphone to go to the mall, I think I program it to go to the mall, but I end up going to the airport, I'm going to be really frustrated when I start seeing Terminal A, Terminal B. I'm going to be going, what? Because I ended up in a destination where I didn't want to go. What's well, because why? I set my GPS wrong. I put the wrong address in. So this is what I want to ask you. What is your internal GPS set on? See, your ultimate goal is what your internal GPS is going to be set on. If you look at Paul, he made the statement, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God. His GPS was set. He knew what he was after and he wouldn't be deterred and would face any hardship or adversity to get to the ultimate destination that his GPS was set on. All right? So is your internal GPS set on this? having enough money so that you'll never lack? Or is it this? Is it to have a lot of friends? To experience notoriety or popularity? To enjoy a certain lifestyle? To be the best in your field of work? You may respond, I want all of these. Most do. But what single desire outweighs all others? That's what you've got to ask yourself. Okay? It's important to make this distinction because if the routes to destinations split, we have to choose. For example, let's say I want to go to the mall and to the grocery store. And I think they're both right next to each other. And I only have time to go to one. I set my GPS for the mall thinking the grocery store is right across the street. My GPS may start on the destination to both the grocery store and the mall, but eventually it's going to split. And it's going to take me to the mall, and the grocery store is going to be miles away. And I only had time to go to one, so I'm going hungry that day. I'm frustrated because mall was second choice, grocery store was first. And that's what I'm trying to get you to do right now. Identify what is your ultimate goal in life. It's important because then that way you'll set your GPS correctly. So if your ultimate goal is to be morally pure, ethically above board, recognized as a good person, healthy, financially secure, you might end up like the rich young ruler, a morally honest man but lacking something. If your goal is to have a lot of friends, you may end up with Aaron in a community, great community, he thinks. And he's the center of the community, yet he's leading their hearts further and further away from God. You may want to be a well-known speaker, an artist, a leader, or you may simply want to have a certain number of followers on Twitter or Facebook. You may achieve that goal, but you may end up being like Uzziah of Israel, who was the most well-known man in the entire nation, but died in isolation. Your internal GPS may be more noble and more benevolent. 
You want to give generously to the poor. You want to help the victims of social injustice. But yet Paul said, I can give everything I have to the poor. I can help the victims of social injustice and still end up wanting. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3. You may want to be the most generous giver in your church. You may end up like Ananias and Sapphira who gave a massive gift, but ended up dying that very same day. If I talk about my life, I thought my ultimate goal was real noble. Years ago, I actually used to go out and pray every morning for an hour and a half. And every single morning, I would go outside. I'd pray an hour and a half, and I would cry out, God, use me. God, use me to heal the sick. God, use me to win multitudes to Jesus. God, send me to the nations to win lost people to Jesus. God, use me to get people free. Use me to preach the gospel all over the world. And I would literally almost pray so passionately that I would scream at times, God, give me souls. After praying this way for about a year and a half, one day the Holy Spirit interrupted me. And he said, your prayers are off target. Your internal GPS is off target. Now I remember again, I felt a little offended. <laughs> I'm like, what? Are you sure you got the right child? Do you have so many of us now? You're just getting us mixed up with one another? <laughs> I'm praying that I would lead people to Jesus, win nations to Jesus. And the Lord said this to me. He said, Judas preached repentance. Judas healed the sick. Judas left everything he had to follow me. Judas got people free. Judas is in hell. I remember when he said that to me. I started quaking. I understand what quaking is. I literally started quaking. I said, God, what should be my goal? And he showed me another rich young ruler. This guy was a prince, prince of a nation. His name's Moses. Moses was raised in the most spectacular home on the planet at the time. Now you have to think about Moses' life. He lives in the royal palace. He's never cleaned a toilet. He's never made his bed. He's never had to cook a meal or clean up dishes. He goes to the royal chefs and says, hey, I want this to eat, and they make it. He's got a Maserati, a Lamborghini. He's got every Harley in the collection. If he doesn't want to drive, he gets his personal chauffeur. His days can be filled with whatever he wants. If he wants competition, he can create a day of competition. If he wants to lead troops, he can lead troops. He's the most eligible bachelor in the whole land. He can not only have girlfriends, he can have wives. He can have a harem of wives. He can have whatever he wants. He is probably one of the most fortunate men on the planet. Because you know what? Nothing's withheld from him except for the throne. And who wants that? Because who wants to worry about a country for 24 hours a day? I get all the benefits and don't have to deal with that. He's got a maid. But yet look what the Bible says. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven twenty four, 24, it says, by faith Moses, when grown, refused the privileges of the Egyptian royal house. He chose a hard life with God's people rather than an opportunistic soft life. What's going on here, guys? Moses' internal GPS dictated his true desire couldn't be attained where he resided. So we read in the 26th verse, he thought that it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. Now the question we got to ask is, what reward was he looking for? Now some people think it's the promised land. I don't think so, because the promised land certainly didn't have anything more than Egypt had, because Egypt was fertile back then. And I don't think Moses could build a better house than what he lived in in the promised land. So what's his reward? I mean, he's leaving everything for this reward. Well, the reward, he really doesn't know when he leaves, but he finds out a few years later what it, what it is. It's kind of like, you know, you, you live in Vermont, and it's winter, and you hate cold, and you think, I'm going south, I want to be on the beach. You head down 995, and you're in Virginia. You go to a gas station. There's a picture of West Palm Beach, or Palm Beach, and you go, that's where I'm going. You plug in the GPS, and you go down to Palm Beach. Moses leaves the Egyptian royal household knowing, hey, what I'm really after, I'm not getting here. 
but he doesn't find out until years later. And years later, he meets God at a bush and he found what he wanted more than anything else. And that was the presence of God because his reward is made clear a few years after that. A few years after that, Israel has come out of Egypt. They have lived on manna. Now I want you to think, I don't want, now listen carefully. You, you're like, whoa, manna, that's amazing. Can you imagine eating chicken for 40 years? <laughs> okay. Their clothes never wore out. They didn't have any malls. Can you imagine wearing the same pair of shoes for 40 years? Conditions have been harsh, very harsh. Sometimes they need divine intervention to get through the day. And look what God says to him in Exodus 33. God says to Moses, he's up on the mountain, God and him are alone. And God says, hey, leave this place. You and the people you brought out of Egypt and go to the land of promise. To, that I promise to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and to their descendants. I will send an angel to guide you and I'll drive out all the ites. <laughs> but, look what he says at the very end. But, I'm not going with you myself. So in other words, God says, hey, this land you've waited 430 years for, go get it. I'm going to send a chief angel, going to drive out all the ites, but I'm not going. Now, what an opportunity. I mean, his approval rating is at an all-time low right now with the nation. Man, all you got to do is walk down. Guys, we're going. We got a choice angel to lead us there. They're going to party. His approval rating goes up. Everything's good. But look what Moses says to God. He says, in verse 15, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Do you know what Moses is saying? He said, I'd rather live in these harsh conditions. Don't bring us up from here. That's the harsh conditions, the desert, the wilderness. No shopping malls, no valleys, no streams, no fruit trees. Arid climate. I would rather be in this with your presence than in the promised land without your presence. This was Moses' reward. Can you imagine the joy it brought God when he said that? You say, joy? God offered to go do something and he turned him down. Yeah. Let me give you an example. Lisa and I were on vacation. There was a great golf course in the area. Some of my friends said, John, let's play golf. My wife looked at me and she said, honey, go ahead and play because she knows how much I enjoy golf. And I remember that day I looked at her and I said, no, baby, I'm going to spend the day with you. You know, she would have been quite happy if I played golf, but she was much happier that I chose her over golf because she knows how much I enjoy it. And so that day with her was amazing because she knew I chose her over something I enjoy doing. See, God makes this offer to Moses, not to Israel. You want to know why? Because if Israel's going to take Egypt, huh? They're going to take the promised land with an angel. I want to have an authentic relationship with you. I want you to want me because of who I am, and I want you because of who you are. I don't want you because of what I can do for you. I want you to want me because of who I am. Are you seeing this? Amen? This is why James the Apostle writes, or do you think the Scripture says in vain, the Spirit who dwells in us, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, yearns. Now listen to the word yearns. Jealously. All right, now what does the word yearn mean? It means he longs intensely and consistently for what? For you. He yearns for you. I mean, consistently, I love that. You know, my wife and I are deeply in love, but I bet if I wake her up at 2.30 in the morning, she's not gonna be yearning for me. <laughs> and I do the same with her. She said, why are you wake me up? But you know, God is continually yearning for you. Now I want you to think about it. He's yearning for you. So, you know, you ever see a guy in love with a girl and he just yearns for her but she's too hung up on other boys how his heart just breaks gosh man I'd marry her I'd take better care of her than any of those guys I love her more than any of those guys but she's just too into other guys but he yearns see the spirit who dwells in he yearns for you God yearns for you 
This is what God was saying to Moses. Man, I brought them out just to bring them to me. He sent Jesus just to bring you to him because he's so in love with you. Look at this. Do you, or do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns what? What's the word? What's the word? What does he mean by that? Well, well, let me just put it to you kind of like this. Do you think my wife, Lisa, would share with me the secrets, the intimate desires of her heart and want to be intimate with me if I was pursuing a relationship with another girl? No. Well, if you look at what James says, the previous verse, look what he says. He said, you're seeking a friendship with the world. You're an adulterer. Now, who is an adulterer? An adulterer is somebody who has a covenant relationship with somebody and violates that covenant to establish a relationship with somebody else. Now, notice he says, the scripture says, you know what he's doing? He's quoting all the times God says, I am jealous for you. Now, God's not jealous of us. He's jealous for us. He wants us all to himself. Now, he says, do you not know the friendship with the world is enmity? Everybody say enmity Enmity. with God. He says, whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself or herself an enemy of God. Now, what's the word friendship? The word friendship is the Greek word phylos, which means fond, friendly, to associate. Philia, philia, it means a friend or to befriend. W.E. Vines writes, these two words have the idea of loving as well as being loved. All right, so whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. In other words, whoever wants to love the world and have the world love them makes himself an enemy of God. Okay, now how does this stand up with Jesus' words? Listen to what Jesus says in John 15, 19. Jesus says, the world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. Okay, now, here's a question we gotta ask. Does the world really hate us? According to Jesus, it should. Now, that would raise a question in my mind. My question is this. If we're hated by the world, then how can we live, operate, and be fruitful in the world? How can we reach the world? Wouldn't we influence the lost more effectively if the world loved us? These are tough questions and they need to be answered. We have to understand the context of what he's talking about here, and we're going to go into it in the next couple sessions. Now, John covers the other side, the apostle, and he says, don't love the world. So Jesus said, the world should hate you. And John says, don't love the world, nor the things of the world. If anybody loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So we're getting real clear here that God's jealous. Okay? He's not saying like, hey, I want a relationship with you, but you can have all kinds of other lovers. It's all right with me. Okay, my wife would never permit that. I would never permit that with my wife. Why do we think God's okay with it? Why do we think God's okay with us committing adultery and befriending the world? See, these are questions we really have to ask nowadays because worldliness has crept into the church. But let's identify this. The world is the Greek word cosmos. That is defined as the present world, the present order of things, as opposed to the kingdom of Christ, and hence always with the idea of transience, worthlessness, and irregular desires. That is from the Complete Word Study Bible. If we were to step back and view our society over time, we would see it's completely changing. It's transient. Change, for the most part, is good. You've got progress, development, scientific development, growth. That's all good. God loves that because he said, be fruitful and multiply. However, in regard to morality, God views changing morality as a step away from him, not a step towards him. In society, what was morally acceptable and commonplace today is often uncommon and regarded as morally and socially wrong yesterday. Let me give you an example. We line up for a typical PG-13 rated movie. In this movie, you're going to have open adultery, open fornication, using God's name in vain. Witchcraft, sorcery. Now, it's not the evil characters of the movie. It's actually the stars, the good people, 
that are living together. Now, take this same PG-13 movie and go 60 years ago to the 1950s. What would happen? Outrage. People would protest. They'd boycott. How dare they show a man and a woman in bed together with hardly any clothes on? What happened? Did we get smarter? Figure out a better way? No, the world is transient. Simply put, cosmos is the culture that is created by darkened minds. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 19, the world around us is under the control of the evil one. The Bible tells us very simply that everything that the world offers, everything is involved in these areas. The gratification of the eyes, the indulgence of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's status or reputation. So in other words, if you want to sum everything up in the world, that's what it's after. Indulgence, gratification, and status. The Encyclopedia Biblical World says worldliness is not a matter of engaging in those practices that some question. It is unthinkingly adopting the perspectives, values, and attitudes of our culture without bringing them under the judgment of God's word. Simply put, we're the source of setting the standard of what's considered good and evil. Now, before I can go any further with you all, I want to state what the worldliness is not. And the reason I need to state this is because here's the thing. Legalism is a killer. And legalism is what crept in to the church that turned people away from the beauty of holiness. Because in the next sessions, two sessions, I'm going to talk about holiness and how amazing and magnificent it is and how much we've been missing but not pursuing it. But before I talk about it, we got to talk about this word legalism. Because this is what's kept people from really pressing into holiness. And yet the Bible tells us to pursue holiness as Christians. Are you with me? So I'm going to actually read some things to you here. When it comes to defining the world, so much emphasis has been placed on form rather than motive. Legalism is spoken of loosely, so I want to define it. Legalism is defined as strict adherence to law, or prescription, especially to the letter rather than the spirit, the judging of conduct in terms of adherence to precise laws. Many of us have heard the horror stories, okay, of this lifeless form of Christianity, pastors pounding their Bibles on pulpits, declaring regulations and rules that people strictly had to adhere to. They tagged women as being worldly who wear pants or any fashionable outfits, jewelry, makeup, piercings, or short style of colored hair. Men didn't escape their soapbox sermons either. Up-to-date fashions are scrutinized, along with tattoos, piercings, and length of hair. It doesn't stop there. Condemnations administered for being seen at parties with sinners. Those who attend movie theaters or other social gatherings are criticized. Friends outside their circle are scrutinized, and any attempt to reach out to the lost in a creative manner is quite often tagged as backsliding. Included in their list of don'ts are dancing, attending social functions, forms of music, the use of television, atmosphere enhancers such as lights or smoke machines, and this is the short list of regulations. I've just listed some of the obvious. However, there's more subtle forms of legalism that are actually more dangerous. These are imposed and often self-imposed criteria that people strictly adhere to in order to earn salvation, grow spiritually, or used to judge outward appearances of others. A sampling of these could be earning God's grace or earning his favor by praying longer hours, how much you fast, or reading prescribed daily portions of the Bible. It could be we struggle to receive forgiveness, so we succumb to the urge of punishing ourselves in some fashion to make up for the wrong we've done. This takes the focus off the blood of Jesus and puts it right back on us. That is legalism. That is worldliness. Legalism could manifest in believing we have a greater access to God because we serve diligently in the ministry or in our church. Or we believe our prayers are heard quickly because we haven't committed any significant sins lately. The unspoken mindset is we fill our spiritual bank account with good behavior, deeds, or works. Legalism doesn't allow a person to rest, enjoy life, 
due to its driving pressure to be constantly busy in ministry. Whether it's church administration, volunteering, or giving time for the poor. Love is not the motivation, but rather attempting to earn God's favor is the focus. The Pharisee who judged the town's notorious sinner is a classic, classic form of legalism. You know what legalism does? It robs people of joy. And you know what my Bible says? My Bible says the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but living a life of goodness and peace and joy. You know what joy is the calling card to the lost? When the lost see how much joy we have, no matter what our circumstances are, they go, what is it about you? You know, some of these people that have been so legalistic that has preached worldliness as a form of legalism should have read this scripture. You have died with Christ and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of this world? Such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Such rules are mere human teachings about the things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise. They may seem good because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline. But they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Interestingly enough, Paul attributes legalistic rules of devotion self-denial, and severe bodily discipline to the powers of this world. It's legalism. Not that licentious sexual immorality, murder, theft, drunkenness, and so forth are not from the world. It's just a different form. Those who are bound to legalism often don't realize the world they preach so strongly to stay away from is exactly where they are held in bondage to. Legalism doesn't clean up a person's heart, and the heart is the world's target. With a better grasp on what the world isn't, I want to go into the next section on what it is and what it involves in having a friendship with the world and how it robs us of the most beautiful life we can have on this earth. Did you get something out of this? 